Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Foundations, our study where we are digging into some of the elemental and pivotal topics of God and, and of His Word. We're starting a new session today, session five, um, God has a courtroom. God has a courtroom. So we've answered the question, what happens when you die, and the question of who is God. And now we're going to establish this fact right here that the Bible teaches, God has a courtroom. Now, a lot of people have never really dug into this. This isn't as much like the first two topics where a lot of people have a lot of opinions about a lot of things and we have to sift through all of that to see what the Bible says. This is going to be a little bit uh, more straightforward in the, in the sense that a lot of people have never really considered this. A lot of people have never considered the way that God works and that he has a courtroom, a system of justice, that it's not arbitrary just because he's God, he just decides what happens at his own will, but he has created a system that you and I can study and test and verify to validate his ways and decide if we want to be a part of his kingdom forever. How cool is that? So this is going to be really exciting. I love this topic. There's a lot of depth to it. And so what we're going to do today is kind of establish a framework, a foundation, if you will, that we can then build on in the next session to understand, kind of step back and see a bigger picture. So one of the first principles that we're going to learn from this study is that God does not forgive sin. When I first kind of came across this idea it was, a, it was like a shocker, like set me back for a minute. I'm like, God doesn't forgive sin. In reality, God forgives sinners. He doesn't forgive sin. And I'm going to explain what I mean by this because I know it's a little bit of a shocker. In English, we talk about the word forgive. And this is kind of how we understand it. You, it's, it's where you stop being angry at someone. Uh, you, you stop a feeling of resentment towards them. You pardon or you excuse something. Now, in Greek, when we translate the word into forgive, what we're translating is a theomy. It's used 147 times in the New Testament, and it's from the Greek word theomy, which means to send away or to transfer. It's a little bit different than our word forgive. So when you read forgive in the New Testament, you have to understand what it's saying is to send away or to transfer. Now, when I, when I realized this, I started researching it a little bit and digging into some of the places where I knew the New Testament talked about forgiveness. And I wanted to see, okay, does God really forgive sins or does he forgive the sinner in, in, in that transferring process? So I went to the Lord's Prayer. It's a great place to kind of start. And he says, forgive us our debts. And remember, forgive to transfer away from us our debts. And I was like, wow, I never really realized that it, said, it doesn't say forgive our debts. It says forgive us our debts. You see the distinction? And then I worked in a church for quite a while where we, we would read 1 John 1, 9. And a lot of churches do this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Again, there it is. Only when I worked at that church, I realized, and I didn't even fully understand this principle yet, but I realized that we left out the word us. And we would say, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I began to realize this. And I said, man, why don't we put this word in here? Because there's no translation I could find that leaves this word out. All of the translations say, and, God, and forgive us our sins. And I began to realize that this was a little bit of a bigger deal, I think, than a lot of Christians realize. And it's because they haven't studied and don't understand the principle of God's courtroom. And people will say this one here. This is another really common one. Um, when Jesus is, is about to heal the, the paralyzed man, and he says, the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And you say, aha, see, forgive sins. God forgives sins. But remember what this word means to transfer sins or to send away sins. From who will those other passages tell us? Forgive us our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So that's what this is saying here. And, and, and in this story, Jesus is saying, you know, you don't believe that I, can, I have the power to transfer your sins away from you. So I'm going to do something that you think is even more powerful, which is to heal this paralyzed man. Which one is easier to say you're forgiven or get up? 
take your mat and walk. So that was Jesus' point here in the context. And I asked myself this question. I said, man, okay, if this principle is not true, if God really does forgive or absolve or excuse or pardon sins, then what was the point of the cross? If God can just say, eh, I'm God, no big deal. I know you didn't mean it. I know you repent. I'm just going to I'm just going to forget about it like it never happened. I'm going to excuse it. No big deal. It's gone. Then why did Jesus have to die if he can do that? The fact of the matter is that God transfers sins. And what happened here on the cross was that Jesus became sin for us. Our sins were transferred onto Jesus to the extent that, that he became just the living embodiment of sin so that the Father's wrath could be poured out onto his shoulders, onto his head on the cross in our place. Our sins were transferred onto Jesus. And that's why Isaiah chapter 53 says it was the Lord's good plan to crush him. This was the plan for our sins to be transferred onto Christ. Now God is a perfect a righteous and infallible judge and accountant. So much so that the Bible says, you are to take a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, all the way down to a bruise for a bruise. A bruise for a bruise. The Bible also says, do not take revenge, for I will repay, says the Lord. And don't you know when the Bible says he will repay, that everything will be accounted for. For I, the Lord, love justice, Isaiah 61 says. In Psalm 33, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. Isaiah 51, my justice will be a light for the nations. Matthew 12, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Every word. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. You see what I'm saying about this? God, God is a perfect judge. He's, in a, he's a perfect accountant. Nothing slips by him. Everything will be accounted for. Now, if, if you wanted to study and understand about, about the law, let's say in, in this country, the United States, what would you do? You would, you would look at the Constitution, our laws. You would look at other laws that have been transcribed. You would look at Supreme Court rulings of what the law is saying. And if you wanted to see justice in action, where would you go? You would probably go someplace like this, a courtroom where you could see justice in action. Now, the cool thing about this is that God has a courtroom. God has a courtroom, and it is called the tabernacle, the sanctuary, or the temple, also sometimes called the tent of meeting. Different things in the Bible, but these are kind of the three main words used for it. And now, now everybody's going to say, oh, not this thing. It's this big bloody thing. There's sacrifices everywhere, and, and priests with funny hats and weird chest plates, and it's really old, or maybe it's Jewish. It was done away with at the cross. There are all of these different things, you know, like, oh, not this thing. I've heard about this. It's so weird. Why are we even studying this? It is so irrelevant. Well, you would be right up until the irrelevant part. <laughs> because in reality, it is old. It, it, it was a Jewish system. There are high priests with funny hats and bloody sacrifices and just weird stuff happening. But it's not irrelevant. And I hope you'll give me a minute here to prove to you why I say that. In Exodus chapter 25, God is giving Moses the prescription for how to, how to build this thing, what to actually make. Because the Israelites had just been wandering around they get to the mountain, they've left Egypt, and they don't really have a lot of direction. So God gives Moses a prescription to make a tabernacle. It's like a, a temporary uh, place of worship that they could set up. Now this tabernacle la later became a more permanent um, place called the temple in the time of David and Solomon when they actually had their own city, their capital, Jerusalem, to live in. Later the temple was destroyed, it was rebuilt, it was destroyed, it was rebuilt. Eventually it was destroyed by the Romans and the Bible says will never be rebuilt. 
And that's why Judaism doesn't really practice the, the temple or the sacrificial system even today. But at this point, God is giving Moses. He says, be sure you make everything according to the pattern that I have shown you on my holy mountain. Now, we're going to jump to the book of Hebrews here, right? Now we're in the New Testament towards the end of the Bible. And, and the author of Hebrews is going to, to connect us back to the temple, the tabernacle system. Now, the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. And you're like, huh, set up by the Lord, not by a human being. The Israelites set up the one here on earth, so what is this actually saying? Well, we keep reading, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one, Jesus, to also have something to offer. For if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest. For there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned in the passage we just read when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Why? Because it was going to be a shadow, a reflection, a copy of the real one that existed in heaven. Does that make sense? So we keep reading in the next chapter of Hebrews, chapter 9. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness or transference. It was necessary then for the copies of heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, animals and things like that. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Wow, the Bible's really clear about this. And all of a sudden, we realize that the sanctuary that we have here is a copy, is a model of the sanctuary that is in heaven where Jesus now ministers for you and for me. So was the sanctuary here, the system, done away with? We don't have to do it anymore? Yes. Why? Because Jesus is doing a way bigger work in the heavenly temple than was being done here on earth. All of those things were just pointing to this. So if that was so important, we have to realize that in order for us to understand what God is doing in his justice system, in his courtroom, which is the heavenly temple, we need to study and understand the model that he gave us here on earth. He gave it to us for this very purpose. Sacrificing lambs and bulls here on earth never saved us. That's what the book of Hebrews is saying here. It never really did anything. It was just a copy that pointed to Jesus and to his, his, his sacrificial work as the Lamb of God, as our high priest, and in all of the other services that the temple included, not just that. So if we want to understand how God works in his system of justice, we need to study the temple. So what we're going to do for the rest of this session is look at some of the pieces, what, what actually was the temple, what was in it. And then in the next session, we're going to look at how those principles actually apply on a larger scale. And, and to close the day, uh, we'll look at three main points. So what I want to illustrate to you is that I want to simplify this because I know a lot of people are a little freaked out. It's like there's a lot here and, and it's like how do I understand all this? Where do I go to read about it? I'm going to walk us through this and I want you to understand that this is, this is simple. It's not complicated. There are seven different components in the temple. Okay, and I've broken this down for us so we can look at it. The temple itself is the first component. This is the structure. It's, it's, a, it's an outer courtyard that's 150 feet long by 75 wide. And there's like linens going around. We actually have a model in the back if you want to look at that afterwards. Um, and, and that's the structure. Then inside there's a, there's a section which has two places, two rooms. The holy place and the most holy place. Simple enough, right? That's the structure. That's the temple, the tabernacle, the sanctuary. There's two altars. I group these together so we can understand. Two different altars, both very important. The bronze altar, or the brazen altar, also called the, the altar of burnt offering, was used for individual sacrifice. 
for individual sacrifice, for you, for your family. The golden altar or the altar of incense was used for corporate sacrifice, the sacrifices to cover the whole community. And we'll talk more about that as we get into it here. So two altars, the temple itself, were basically halfway there. Not too complex. A wash basin or a laver, this is what the priests would use before they made sacrifices and before they entered the holy place. A lampstand, which was used to light the holy place because there was no light in there. There was a table, the table of showbread or the table of presence, which, where the priest would commune with God and they would have fresh bread there and they would also pour out liquid offerings and things like that. And then you had the Ark of the Covenant, which is what most people are very familiar with. This enthroned God's very presence with the people. God's presence dwelt here on the Ark. It's pretty cool. And the tabernacle, the, the word literally means like, like to dwell with or to tabernacle with. It's, it's like a verb. God dwells with his people in this place. And the place where he dwelt was on the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says once it was all set up that, that the Shekinah glory, God's glory just came down and, and dwelt. And light could be seen just radiating from the most holy place. Powerful stuff. So these are the elements. Seven different elements. If you want to get these down a little later, you can. I'm going to keep rolling here. And we're going to walk through, I have some visualizations for you of each of these seven pieces. And I'm going to read from the book of Exodus as we look at these so we can understand what it looked like, what these elements were. So the first one, for the framework of the tabernacle, construct frames of acacia wood. Each frame must be 15 feet high and 27 inches wide with two pegs under each frame. Make all the frames identical. Make 20 of these frames to support the curtains on the south side of the tabernacle. Also make 40 silver bases, two bases under each frame with the pegs fitting securely into the bases. For the north side of the tabernacle, make another 20 frames with their 40 silver bases, two bases under each frame. Then you are to make six frames for the rear, the west side of the tabernacle, along with two additional frames to reinforce the rear corners of the tabernacle. These corner frames will be matched at the bottom and firmly attached at the top with a single ring, forming a single corner unit. Make both of these corner units the same way. So there will be eight frames at the rear of the tabernacle set in 16 silver bases with two bases under each frame. Make crossbars of acacia wood to link the frames. Five crossbars for the north side of the tabernacle, five for the south side. Also make five crossbars for the rear of the tabernacle, which will face west. The middle crossbar attached halfway up the frames will run all the way from one end of the tabernacle to the other. Overlay the frames with gold and make gold rings to hold the crossbars. Overlay the crossbars with gold as well. Set up this tabernacle according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Pretty cool, huh? So this is the structure of the tabernacle itself. All right, now we're going to keep moving, and, and I'm going to go from the outside to the inside, and we're going to look at each element, okay? So first is the bronze altar, also called the brazen altar, and this is from Exodus 27. Using acacia wood, construct a square altar seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and four and a half feet high. Make horns for each of its four corners, so that the horns and altar are all one piece. Overlay the altar with bronze. Make ash buckets, shovels, basins, meat forks, and fire pans, all of bronze. Also, make a bronze grating for it and attach four bronze rings at its four corners. Install the grating halfway down the side of the altar under the ledge. For carrying the altar, make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with bronze. Insert the poles through the rings on the two sides of the altar. The altar must be hollow, made from planks. Build it just as you were shown on the mountain. 
So this was the altar of burnt offering where people would come and make their sacrifices. If you and I lived in this time and we were, and we were Israelites, we would actually come and make our sacrifices at this altar with the priest. It's right in the front of the courtyard, which is where, uh, sorry ladies, but only the men were allowed there. Uh, different day, different age. <laughs> And so uh, in this place, you know, the men would come as a representative of their whole family, not every single person, but one from each family, kind of the patriarch, if you will, would come and make atonement. He would have a designated day, and the people would be rotating on a schedule coming in to make their offerings for the year. All right, we keep on moving, and we get to the laver, or the, the wash basin. This is from Exodus 30. Make a bronze wash basin with a bronze stand. Place it between the tabernacle and the altar of burnt offering and fill it with water. Aaron and his sons will wash their hands and feet there. Now get this. They must wash with water whenever they go into the tabernacle to appear before the Lord and when they approach the altar to burn up their special gifts to the Lord or they will die. They must always wash their hands and feet or they will die. This is a permanent law for Aaron and his descendants to be observed from generation to generation. Now, Aaron's descendants was the priesthood. These were the people that, that became the priests in Israel. Aaron was the first uh, high priest. So they would have to wash before they made sacrifice, before they go into the temple as a symbol of purifying themselves before the Lord, before they could make their sacrifices. All right, now this is pretty cool, and this is where it starts to get a little expensive. As you go into the, the holy place, you're going to see this candlestick. Make a lampstand of pure hammered gold. Make the entire lampstand and its decorations of one piece. The base, center, stem, lamp cups, buds, and petals. Make it with six branches going out from the center stem, three on either side. Each of the six branches will have three lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds, and petals. Craft the center stem of the lampstand with four lamp cups shaped like al almond blossoms, complete also with buds and petals. There will also be an almond bud beneath each pair of branches where the six branches extend from the center stem. The almond buds and branches must all be of one piece with the center stem, and they must be hammered from pure gold. Then make the seven lamps for the lampstand, and set them so that they reflect their light forwards. The lamp snuffers and trays must also be made of pure gold. You will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand and its accessories. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you on the mountain. So at the market value of gold this morning, this would be like a one and a half million dollar lampstand, if that puts it in perspective, a lampstand only. Now the whole place was overlaid with gold, uh, and, and a lot of different pieces were overlaid with gold, but this was made of pure gold, pure hammered gold. And it's really actually pretty cool because all of the people of the community of Israel would bring their jewelry, would bring you know, their resources that they had to contribute to make this. Uh, pretty awesome, pretty awesome. So we get next to, uh, to the table of showbread or the table of presents. Then make a table of acacia wood, 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it with pure gold, and run a gold molding around the edge. Decorate it with a three inch border all around and run a gold molding along the border. Make four gold rings for the table and attach them at the four corners next to the four legs. Attach the rings near the border to hold the poles that are used to carry the table. Make these poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Make special containers of pure gold for the table also. Bowls, ladles, pitchers, and jars to be used in pouring out liquid offerings. Place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me at all times. 
And they would have 12 loaves here, one from each tribe. And the priests would have an opportunity to actually just commune with the Lord here. Really, really cool. Inside of the holy place. So, two more things. We get to the second altar. The altar of incense. Called the, the most holy altar. Then make another altar of acacia wood for burning incense. Make it 18 inches square and 36 inches high with horns at the corners carved from the same piece of wood as the altar itself. Overlay the top, sides, and horns of the altar with pure gold and run a gold molding around the entire altar. Make two gold rings and attach them on opposite sides of the altar below the gold molding to hold the carrying poles. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Place the incense altar just outside the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant in front of the Ark's cover, the place of atonement, that covers the tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. I will meet you there. Every morning when Aaron maintains the lamps, he must burn fragrant incense on the altar. And each evening when he lights the lamps, he must go again to burn incense in the Lord's presence. This must be done from generation to generation. Do not offer any unholy incense on this altar or burnt offerings or grain offerings or liquid offerings. Once a year, Aaron must purify the altar by smearing its horns with blood from the offering made to purify the people from their sins. This will be a regular annual event from generation to generation for this is the Lord's most holy altar. So a different, a different feel, a different purpose to this altar than the other one. And I can't wait for next week to really delve into this uh, with us. But the last piece here, and probably the most familiar one, the Ark of the Covenant from Exodus 25. Have the people make an ark of acacia wood, a sacred chest, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it inside and outside with pure gold and run a molding of gold all around it. Cast four golden rings and attach them to its four feet with two rings on either side. Make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. These carrying poles must stay inside the rings. Never remove them. When the ark is finished, place inside it the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant which I will give to you. Then make the ark's cover, the place of atonement, from pure gold. It must be 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. Then make two cherub from hammered gold and place them on the two ends of the atonement cover. Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover making it all of one piece of gold. The cherubim will face each other and look down on the atonement cover with their wings spread above it. They will protect it. Place inside the altar the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant which I will give you. Then place the atonement cover on top of the ark. I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. Wow. That's intense. That's really intense. So God is going to meet with his people here in this place. Okay, now I'm excited because we, we've walked through each of these pieces and each of them has different purposes and different ideas attached to them and, ha and have a lot of significance. So now that we've done that, I want to take us on a, a virtual reality tour of the temple itself. So check this out. Here we get, we're, we're approaching the temple from the front and you can see the different colors and, and the, the kind of banners here on the front gate and then the linens that go all the way around. And as we approach here, you see the altar of burnt offering, the brazen altar with the fire beneath it. 
and this is where the priests would atone for the sins of the people as they would come in day after day on a schedule and offer their sin offerings to the Lord. You can see here where they would actually sprinkle the blood on the horns of the altar as a part of that and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And as they would pass that, they would move towards the holy place, wash themselves in the laver, which we talked about. And only the priests were allowed in here. The men of Israel, if they were Israelites, were allowed in the courtyard, but only the priesthood was actually allowed into the holy place. And as they passed through there, you see on the left, the lampstand on the right, the table of showbread, and there's the golden altar in the middle, right in front of the veil which covers the Ark of the Covenant. There's the menorah of seven candles giving light to this room. There's the table of presents, the table of showbread with the, the twelve loaves. And here's the golden altar where the priests would minister before the Lord in the morning and in the evening each day would burn incense. And as you pass through the veil, you would get to the most holy place where only the high priest was allowed once a year to make atonement for the people of Israel. That's pretty cool, right? So, when the high priest would go in there, it's funny, they would actually tie a rope onto his foot because no one was allowed to go in there. Even the high priest himself could only go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So if he died, it's like, <laughs> how do you get him out? And so they would tie a rope onto his foot so like if he stops moving, I guess they could just <laughs> yank him back out. But, but ultimately, I mean, this is where God's presence was and it was very serious. There's even a story in the Bible of a man who, who wanted to steady the Ark of the Covenant and he reaches out because it's, it's falling to catch it and, and he dies. And these are the kinds of stories where people get a little frustrated with the Old Testament. They're like, man... That God, man, he just kills that guy. He's just trying to help out to steady the ark. But it's like, this is God's presence. And part of the illustration that we see from the temple is that, that God doesn't, he, he doesn't dwell with sin. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work. They don't go together. His, his holiness can just not be in the presence of sin. And so, you know, as far as that story goes, I think probably the guy assuming that his sinful hand as a sinner would be, would be enough to catch the ark and somehow that would be better than it touching a sinless ground. You know, there was, there's a certain arrogance there where he defied God's law, which was very clear not to do. So there's a lot of stories like that in the Old Testament, but I hope you can see the importance of this was where God's presence was dwelling with his people. So it was a really serious thing. Now, I want to kind of wrap up here by addressing these three things. God's temple system teaches us, I think, three main things that I, that I want to touch on, and we'll dig deeper into them, but this is just going to kind of be a quick review. Number one, we touched on this. Sin is transferred, not forgiven. Sin is transferred, not forgiven. Now, I want you to understand this. Um, when the people would come to make an offering, they would, the patriarch or whoever was coming in, would, would have an animal with, with him, and, and he would place his hands on the animal's head. When he did this, he would pray and then ask God for forgiveness of his sins and, and would transfer his sins onto that animal. Just like our sins were transferred onto Jesus, the Lamb of God, right? Same, same thing happening here. He would transfer the sins onto the animal. Now that animal could die in sin in his place. So he doesn't have to die. So his family doesn't have to die. All of their sins were transferred onto it. And the animal's throat would be cut. And, and as the blood spilled out, some of the blood would be caught and it would be, it would be, the priest would dip his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. That first altar that we saw, right? The bronze altar. And he's putting, he, capturing some of the blood from the animal and putting it on the horns. Why? Because there's a record, a transaction of sin that has taken place. And, and that ultimately is going to have to be dealt with. It doesn't just happen and then, eh, you know, we never remember it. 
every record of every sacrifice and every offering was kept. Sometimes they would put the blood on the sides of the altar for different circumstances. For others, they would put it on the horns of the altar like here. And actually, the same thing happened in other cases at the, at the altar of incense, the golden altar. The priest put some of the blood on the horns of that altar. So what I want you to see here is that there's a transaction happening. There's a transference happening. And there's a record of sin that is being maintained throughout the year in this temple. Okay? And that's why on the Day of Atonement, and we'll get to this more in just a minute, the high priest has to purify the most holy place and do the same for the entire tabernacle because of the defiling sin and rebellion of the Israelites throughout the year. Okay, so God's temple system teaches us that sin is transferred, not forgiven. Number two, it teaches us that justice requires restitution. Restitution. Restitution is a concept that we don't really find a lot, that we don't really understand in our current system. It's recompense or, or payment for injury or loss. There's a little bit of this today in our courts where uh, you may have to pay something in a lawsuit for like pain and suffering or something like that. But it's really difficult because it's like, how do, you, how do you quantify that? How do you put a number on that? God is interested in dealing with this, not just in the cost of sin, but, but the restitution, the damages that have been caused because of it. For example, take in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 6. The Lord says to Moses, Suppose one of you sins against your associate and is unfaithful to the Lord. Suppose you cheat or steal or commit fraud or suppose you find lost property and you lie about it. In all of these cases, you must give back whatever you stole. Okay, that's first and foremost. You have to give it back. You must also make restitution by paying the full price plus an additional 20% to the person you've harmed and present a guilt offering. So you got to give back what you took, first of all. That's just, that just makes it, you know, gives back what, what's already owed. Then you have to pay restitution because you've taken something from the person. You've inconvenienced them. You may have harmed them in some way. So you pay restitution for that. And you have to make a guilt offering before the Lord for your sin. So think if, like, uh, if I stole your car, right? To make things right, yeah, I got to give your car back in the same condition, or if I've lost it, I've got to give you the value for what I've taken. Now, on top of that, I've caused you a great inconvenience or maybe some harm. Maybe you weren't able to get to work on time. Maybe you lost your job because of that. Maybe uh, your life just, you weren't able to accomplish or to do the things you were supposed to. I've, I've, I've caused you damage other than just taking the car. That's restitution. And then beyond that, I have my own issue with the Lord to deal with an offering. So I want to take this from the Old Testament and move it to the New Testament to an example I think we can understand very clearly. When Jesus comes by, he looks up at Zacchaeus. You know, the wee little man climbed up a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Jesus calls him by name, Zacchaeus, you come down. Sing that with Abby. Quick, come down. I'm going to be a guest at your house today. Zacchaeus quickly climbs down and, and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. And we like, we look at these people and we're like, oh, you nasty, judgmental. Okay, look, Zacchaeus stole money from all of them. He's a notorious sinner. This is the guy that walks in the room and you're like, that scallywag owes me a hundred bucks. If you're a pirate, I don't know what else you call him. <laughs> uh, He's a notorious sinner. Everybody knows this guy's taking money from them. Everybody knows. So they're upset. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. And man, this is like on par with like the Nineveh story where all the people repented. This is a big one in scripture. Zacchaeus, this tax collector who stole money from all these people, he encounters Jesus, Jesus' love and his grace and his mercy in spite of his sin. And he says, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. That's a guilt offering right there. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Zacchaeus was either really wealthy or really broke after this. I don't know which one. I would like to think that he pretty much gave up everything. Like half of what he owes, he gives to the poor. And the other half of what he has, he owes people and he just gives it. In the Old Testament, there are situations which would require 400% restitution. So think about that next time you're thinking about stealing something. Zacchaeus 
goes to, not only does he give half of what he has to the Lord as a guilt offering, but he goes to the fullest extent of the law and gives back 400% of what he took back to all the people. And that is why Jesus says, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Faith expressing itself in obedience. We're going to talk about that when we get to our study on salvation uh, a little bit later down the road. So do you see restitution at play here? Now this gets a little bit more complicated sometimes when it doesn't have to do with money. But let's say it, it's like a horrible situation or a tragedy of some sort. Um, I think of really awful situations that I read about in the news where like perhaps a child has been killed or just something grievous and terrible like that. And it's like, Whatever you believe about the death penalty, maybe sometime we can do a video study on that. But let's just say a person is given the death penalty for the murder of a child. And their life is taken because the child's life was taken. Can that cover the effect of the loss of that child's life? I mean, a, a family completely destroyed, parents just grieved and, and in the pit of depression, uh, siblings separated from their brother or sister, you know, that, how that affects their development. What about what the world has been robbed of in the life of that child? Maybe was going to, going to cure a disease or going to create some beautiful piece of artwork that would inspire people. You know, there's so much that has been lost besides just simply a life. And how can we deal with that? You take the life of the criminal and you say, okay, life for a life. In God's economy, in God's justice system, He is going to deal with restitution all of the damages that have been caused because of our decisions. That's something that the temple system teaches that, that blows by most people if they're not aware of it, if they don't study it. So the temple system teaches us that justice also requires restitution. And then the third thing, as we're going to wrap up here for today, God's temple system teaches us that the temple required cleansing. And I touched on this when I talked about the blood being put on the horns of the altar. A lot of people, they don't understand, and a lot of Christians, and they think that, that because this sin was transferred to Jesus, and, and Jesus died to pay the, the price for sin, and so then now everything's just hunky-dory, and we're all good, and there's nothing else that has to happen. And we're just waiting for Jesus to just pluck us up, and, and then burn up all the wicked, and then we'll be in heaven forever, and that's it. And they don't realize that God has already given us a template. He's given us a system of dealing with sin. And, and part of that system shows that there is a record. When sin is transferred, when our sin was transferred onto Jesus, when the sin is transferred onto the animal and the animal's killed, when Jesus died on our behalf, the record of sin, the blood on the horns of that altar, still remained. And so what did God give as a prescription for dealing with that record? Well, there was one day a year, and we just read this verse, the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would purify, starting in the most holy place, moving out to the holy place and the entire tabernacle eventually because of the defiling sin and rebellion of the Israelites. This had to be cleansed. The temple had to be cleansed to be made whole again because there's this record of guilt and of sin still there in the temple. This was the Day of Atonement. And we're going to get into this next week. It's kind of where we're going to pick up in the next session um, on the Day of Atonement. But what I want for us to understand is that cleansing process has to happen. It has to happen. Now, of all of the concepts in the Bible, the temple system and services are among the most profound and beautiful and amazing. They tie together every single biblical concept in a way that allows us to, to view, to study, and to, and to test and to understand God and His will and His ways. It provides a backdrop for us to study those things and to decide for ourselves whether we think that his ways and his system of justice is valid. It's really, really powerful. And I want to leave us with this. The Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the temple. This was the, the most exciting, spectacular, uh, nerve-wracking day of the year in the Jewish culture. They still celebrate this even today, even though the temple, the sacrificial system has been kind of done away with. Um, still a huge, huge day. The biggest if that day is so massive because, because it's taking care of the record of guilt in the temple here on earth, and that temple here on earth is just a fraction, is a copy, is a shadow 
of the one that exists in heaven. In the same way that the model temple we have in the back, it's not really conducting sacrifices and really doing things like it was in the temple here on earth. It's minute in comparison to that. Well, in the same way, the one here on earth is so minute in comparison to what's happening in the one in heaven. Same thing. So if the Day of Atonement is so huge for that temple here on earth, how huge do you think it is when it's happening on the, the heavenly scale, the global scale of the, the universe? So that's what we're going to dig into. I hope you'll join us next time for session six with our study on God has a courtroom. If you want more information, please visit us online at rrfaithministries.org or you can email us at rrfaithministries at gmail.com. We'll see you in the next session. Faith Ministries is a not-for-profit religious education organization and is not affiliated with any denomination or church. Any copyrighted materials used in this video are intended for educational purposes only and are covered under the Fair Use Act.